So in the last video, we looked at the basic structure of the cardiovascular system, including the blood vessels, uh, the arteries, veins, capillaries, microcirculation, lymphatics, and so forth. And here we're going to look at the heart specifically. So we'll look at all the heart anatomy, the different borders of the heart, the embryological development, um, uh, lo look a little bit at fetal circulation, the different membranes and layers of the heart, muscle, uh, the valves of the heart, coronary arteries, and then we'll talk about the nerve innervation and conduction pathways of the heart. Um, then in subsequent videos, we'll look at the actual physiology of how all this fits together. So the heart has four chambers, uh, two atrial chambers and two ventricles. And if you actually look at a heart, um, the atria are very small in comparison to the ventricles. So we really see the ventricles are predominant. And of the two, the left ventricle is the most predominant. Again, when we use anatomical left, that's on the patient's left side, not the left side in the pictures that you see. So in this particular picture, left is over here on the right and the left is on the right ventricle is on the left. Um, the right atrium receives venous blood from remember both the superior and inferior vena cava. So they come in to the right atrium. They're gonna pass through a valve. The first of what's called the atrial ventricular valves and this one's called the tricuspid valve. Um, it's gonna go into the right ventricle. And then from the right ventricle, we'll go through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary artery. And again, it's all drawn in blue here because this is all deoxygenated blood. And then it's gonna pass through the lungs, come out of the lungs, uh, oxygenated through the pulmonary vein, which will then collect in the right left atrium. Um, there is a, another valve here called the mitral valve. It's another type of atrial ventricular valve, mitral valve. That's the blood will then enter the left atrium and then exit via the aortic valve. <clears throat> and uh, that will enter the ascending aorta. Uh, descending aorta, and they go off on all the different uh, side arteries. So that's the blood flow of the valve, so of, of the uh, blood through the heart. So notice there are four uh, valves. There is the tricuspid valve here, uh, there is the pulmonary valve, there's the mitral valve, and then there is the aortic valve. Notice that the blood vessels coming into the atria do not have valves. So there's no valve coming from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium or the pulmonary or the uh, superior or inferior vena cava into the right atrium. So four valves, and we'll look at the structure of those valves uh, as we go. So know that the, know about the basic blood flow through the heart and be able to kind of be familiar with that. So if you look at the uh, atria, they are thin walled. Um, they are finely, uh, so that the actual muscle cells that make up cardiac muscle are called myocytes. So cardiac myocytes make up the heart muscle wall. And um, some of the myocytes, most of the myocytes are re like regular contracting cells in their skeletal muscle. They have actin and myosin filaments. Uh, I'll point out later that one of the unique features of the cardiac myocytes is they actually have these what are called intercalated discs. So they're joined by these discs and that's gonna allow ions to flow from one muscle cell to another. And why that's important is that the, uh, the cells that are joined in that way can all can, can, can contract together. And this forms what's called a syntitium. So the heart muscle is different than skeletal muscle or smooth muscle in that it can form a syntitium. Um, but if you look at some of the myocytes in the atrial, atrial wall, they are finely differentiated. They lose a lot of their uh, muscle fibers and they become specialized conducting cells. And so we'll look at those cells. They actually can create different types of action potentials within them. And that's going to be part of the both pacemaker and the conducting system of the heart. In fact, in the atria, we have two pacemakers. They're called the SA or sinoatrial and AV atrial ventricular nodes. And uh, this will be a very important part of the electrical con conduction to the heart. Um, we can think of the atria as being more nerve-like, even though these myocytes are not nerves, so, uh, or not neurons, uh, make sure you differentiate that. So cardiac myocytes in the cardiac conducting system is made up of heart muscle cells, not from neurons. There are, however, neurons in the heart wall. And we'll look at those. Some of them are from the sympathetic system, some are from the parasympathetic, and some are intrinsic to the heart muscle itself. Um, so that's the atria, thin walls, more finely differentiated, nerve-like. Um, and then the ventricles, which are more thick-walled. If you look here at the left ventricle in particular, very thick wall, 
And uh, if you look at the myocytes, they're primarily those contracting kind of myocytes. They have the muscle fibers. Um, and the ones that conduct electrical current are actually uh, crudely differentiated. So they look nothing like the finely differentiated myocytes in the atrium. And we call these the Purkinje fibers. Um, we can think of this as being very metabolic, very muscle-like. Um, and this is where the majority of the heart's oxygen uh, is utilized and so on and so forth. So um, that's sort of the opposite pole to the atria. So we can think of the atria as reflecting more our nerve sensory organs, which again in the whole human being is kind of concentrated in the head. And the ventricles are more reminiscent, reminiscent of your metabolic organs. So we can think of those two being smashed together to form the heart. And so the heart really is more of a regulatory organ that's kind of regulating your nerve sensory activity with your metabolic activity. So the heart has four borders, uh, right and left, and then a superior inferior, and two surfaces, anterior and uh, inferior, posterior, to be really anterior and posterior. Um, the right border is vertical. Um, so that's actually formed by the right atrium. And that's depicted here, right border. The right atrium is right here. Um, the left border is a little bit more rounded um, because of the protrusion of the left ventricle. Um, part of the left atrium also forms it, but it's mostly that left ventricle. The inferior border, and that's down here, um, is formed by the right ventricle, which would be over here, and um, what's called the cardiac apex. That's this region right here. And that's actually, I'll talk about where that can be palpated or listened to. You can actually feel that at the uh, fifth rib space uh, on the mid clavicular line. So if you draw a line uh, basically through the nipple uh, straight down parallel to the center line of the body, um, hit the fifth rib space, that's where the apex of the heart typically would be heard uh, the loudest. And so we can actually put a stethoscope up there and listen to it or even put your finger up there and you might actually feel a vibration from the heartbeat at the apex. So that's the apex of the heart. Um, and that helps to form the inferior border. Um, and we call that point of where we feel the apex, the point of maximal impulse or PMI. So we can palpate the PMI there. Um, the left atrium forms the posterior surface of the heart. So you can't really see it in this uh, picture here and has close proximity to the esophagus. So this gives you a little bit of an orientation of kind of where the heart is. Notice that, of course, if this is the midline of the body, the heart is asymmetrical, so it sticks off more to the left. So here's the apex. This is where the PMI would be uh, palpated. Here's the left rounded border. Here is the right border. Here's the inferior border. And then we have the anterior surface, which is all this here. And then the posterior surface would be on the back side. And um, so that would be that. So our surface here really should be not anterior inferior, but anterior posterior. Okay, so four borders and four surfaces. The heart itself fills up the space called the mediastinum, which again is that space between the lungs. And then here we have the diaphragm on the bottom and the heart rests right against that. And this is actually um, where we'll talk more about kind of, for example, chest pain, how to differentiate that. The sensory nerves that innervate the heart, uh, the visceral nerves. Um, often if we have any sort of irritation on the esophagus behind the heart here, Remember, the esophagus is behind the trachea, so you can't see it in this picture. Uh, so like from acid reflux, uh, the sensory nerves that innervate that region of the esophagus enter the spinal cord at the same region that the sen sensory nerves from the heart enter. And um, so that's where we, our brain will get confused, thinking you might be having a heart attack when in reality you're having really bad acid reflux. So that'll be one of the differentials for chest pain. Same applies to the sensory nerves in the left arm where they enter the spines the same place as the sensory, the visceral nerves from the heart. All right. Okay, so keep that in mind as we go because we'll be talking about um, the different borders and surfaces in reference to the different regions of the heart. Cardiogenesis refers to the uh, embryology, the embryologic development of the heart. It first develops from the mesodermal tissue. Remember our ectoderm is more nerve sensory tissue, endoderm more metabolic digestive, and then mesoderm in between. Um, the heart is actually the first functional organ to develop in the embryo. And it actually forms, if we look at around day 18, um, this would be looking down from the amniotic cavity. 
Uh, the embryo kind of looks like a flat disc that's sort of wider at what will become the head of the uh, future embryo. Um, so this is actually, this is the neural plate. Remember the neural plate is what will develop the neural tube and that's gonna develop the nervous system. And notice there's an area of little blood islands that develops, it's called the cardiogenic area outside the neural tube. And it sort of accumulates out here almost like a little horseshoe. Um, and so this area is uh, called the splanchnopleuric membrane. And um, it's this area of cells is known as the cardiogenic area. Uh, and these cells are going to form actually the cardiac myoblasts. These will be the precursor cells to the heart muscle and blood islands, which will form sort of a primitive circulatory system. So really the precursors to your blood cells and blood vessels. So those little islands will all join together. And around day 20, we're going to get two what are called endocardial tubes. Um, so the tubes will develop on either side. Of the um, of the kind of the, in the horseshoe shape here, and um, you can see that in the picture here is the endocardial tubes, and uh, so they'll eventually fuse. They develop little blood vessels that connect between them, and they'll fuse into one giant by day 22, one larger structure here with kind of uh, little blood vessels going in and out the bottom and the top, and this is actually called the tubular heart. So this will be the single uh, heart tube, and it actually starts to beat at around day 21. So and that's in this picture here. This structure starts to pulsate autonomously on its own. Now, one little comment I'll say is that if you look at the embryo at this time, there is actually flow of blood through these blood islands and through what are forming as these little tubes um, that occurs before the heart starts to beat. So it, also, it brings up this interesting question, is the heart really driving the blood? Is it really causing the blood to flow or is it more just involved in pressurizing the blood flow and so forth so forth because embryologically the heart starts to beat about a day after the blood itself starts to flow and as we'll see the metabolic activities in the tissue have a lot to do with what makes the blood flow in those tissues um, by day 22 the endocardial tubes and the tubular heart are actually pushed into the thoracic cavity so what's going to happen is this is going to fold inward. I can't really draw it here. Imagine it folding down into the paper. Um, and uh, as it folds, these cells are going to be brought inward. They're going to go under the chin and then uh, find them their way into the thoracic area. So very interesting development where the heart really begins forming above, almost like a halo, a crown above what will form, what will become the head, and that will internalize down into the thorax. By the time that happens, the uh, tube fusion will have happened. So we're going to essentially at 22 days or so, we're going to find that structure I pointed out here as the tubular heart. And this tubular heart has five different regions. Um, starting from the top, we have what's called the truncus arteriosus, then the bulbus cordis, then the primitive ventricle, primitive of atrium, and then way down here is the uh, sinus venosus. Um, and these are going to become the different regions of the heart. So it, the heart is actually initially, the blood is actually flowing initially from the bottom upward towards the head. So that's the typical, the, the first type of blood flow. And then what's gonna happen is these, this tubular heart's gonna twist. So it's gonna start to twist on either side and uh, we'll kind of reach around and basically that's gonna form by day 25 the structure you see here where uh, we actually have a uh, right and left atrium. We have a, uh, a uh, what's going to become the left ventricle here. And then we have uh, what's going to become the aorta and all the different arches that come off of that. So that will be kind of scanning ahead into day 25, the formation of the actual heart structures. This process of the heart folding is called cardiac looping. Uh, so cardiac looping will form the different chambers of the heart. So the truncus arteriosus becomes the aorta and the pulmonary artery. The bulbous cordis will become the right ventricle. The primitive ventricle becomes the majority of the left ventricle. Primary atrium forms the front of the left and right atrium. And the sinus venosus will form the back part of the right atrium. And importantly, this is where the pacemakers of the heart, the SA and the AV nodes, will be located. So 
going back up to this picture again it's you know the blood is flowing from bottom to top from tail to head um, by the time this twisting uh, is finished it's going to have its normal kind of blood flow where it's going to go from the atria outward now now the heart's going to function differently in the fetus we'll look at that because essentially we need to bypass the lungs the fetus is not uh, breathing uh, through the lungs so we need to have a separate system there so i'll talk about what happens with that um, the heart will be partitioned into different chambers and so basically we start to see inner divisions happening uh, by day 28 which are mostly completed by eight weeks. So by eight weeks, we see the actual mitral valve, I'll draw it blue here, uh, and the tricuspid valve uh, separating the atria from the ventricles. Notice there is this hole between the right atrium and the left atrium called the foramen ovale. And this is gonna be one of those systems in place in the fetus to allow blood to come into the right atrium from the body um, and not go into the right ventricle, because remember in the adult, the right ventricle will send it right to the lungs through the pulmonary valve and then through the uh, pulmonary artery. In this case, the blood's gonna flow into the right atrium. It's gonna go through this hole, the foramen ovale, into the left atrium, down into the left ventricle, then out through the aorta and into circulation. So this is one of the ways the uh, fetus can actually bypass the lungs is by having that hole between the atria and the upper chambers of the heart. And notice there's a similar kind of gap um, down here, although this usually fuses up by eight weeks. Um, I'll talk about some of the congenital malformations where that hole, the foramen ovale, can actually stay open uh, after birth. And unfortunately, that can lead to a shunting of blood uh, from the right atrium into the left atrium. And that can significantly decrease cardiac output uh, and decrease the oxygenation of the blood. By six weeks, the fetal heartbeat can be detected. Um, again, it starts beating around day 21, 22 after conception. And usually at that point, it's close to the maternal heart rate of about 75 to 80 beats per minute. Um, that heart rate's gonna increase by about 3.3 beats per minute every day. It's gonna peak at about 165 to 185 beats per minute in early seventh week. And then it starts to slow after nine weeks uh, to about 145 beats per minute. Uh, and that's going to be the typical heart rate at birth. Okay, so that's the overall development. I know it's a little confusing with all those pieces, but get the general theme here of how the cardiogenic area is going to form into the endocardial tubes, which then fuse together. They're going to migrate down to the thorax, undergo a twisting motion, the looping, and that will eventually form the four chambers of the heart. And I believe there's some good uh, YouTube videos available if you want to see that more in animation. So the fetus is connected uh, by the umbilical cord to the placenta, and the placenta is you know, connected through the uterine wall to the maternal uh, circulation. Uh, importantly, uh, as we'll see in embryology, the maternal circulation does not directly connect with the fetal circulation. So we have mom's sort of arterial blood coming in, venous blood, uh, it's pooling here, and nutrients will be exchanged across different membranes. Waste products will go into the maternal blood, but there's no direct contact of maternal blood with fetal blood uh, under normal circumstances. The placenta will take those nutrients and then deliver nutrients from the mother to the fetus via the umbilical vein, and there's one of them that will carry oxygen and everything else to the fetus. And then all the waste products and uh, deoxygenated blood and whatnot will pass from the fetus to the mother via two umbilical arteries. So just remember that umbilical vein actually in this case brings oxygenated blood from the mother to the fetus via one uh, vein. And then two arteries will take deoxygenated blood from the fetus to back to the placenta. Um, there are two what are called fetal circulatory shunts, and I just mentioned one of them. And these are going to shunt uh, blood, essentially allowing blood to bypass the fetal lungs and the fetal liver. So let's look at what these shunts are. So the first one is the foramen ovale. Um, I already mentioned that one, and that's an opening in the uh, interatrial septum. So that's gonna allow blood to pass from the right atrium into the left atrium without going through the right ventricle to the lungs and so forth. Um, and that's basically shunting blood from the right side of the heart to the left side of the blood. It shunts about two thirds of the blood returning to the heart. So most of it 
in the fetus is going to go. Most of the blood going back to the heart will go through the foramen ovale. At birth, it should close, and that becomes the fossa ovalis. So it's a little remnant there you can actually see. In, for example, a um, you know, uh, in a cadaver, you might see a little fossa there, a little depression, and that's the remains of the foramen ovale. Um, it can so happen that the uh, foramen ovale remains open, and that's called a patent foramen ovale, or PFO. And that creates what's called an atrial septal defect. And that's basically where the septum that should divide the right and left atrium is remains open. Uh, this occurs, is very common, occurs up to 25% of all adults. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, it's minor and it causes very little problems and it remains undetected in most people. Um, in some though, it can become symptomatic. In the most severe cases, uh, we see things like an increase in stroke risk and that's because we get this blood coming in from the right atrium it's gonna pass in the left atrium causing a lot of turbulence. And we'll see one of the factors that makes blood more likely to clot inside of blood vessels is increased turbulence. And um, so anytime you have turbulence in the blood flow, there's a risk that the platelets will become activated, will start to stick together, and that will start to form a blood clot. Um, and uh, that, that there can be a risk of that with PFO, and that might lead to strokes as those clots now are going to uh, pass from the left atrium into the left ventricle, out to the aorta, up to the brain. Um, sleep apnea and migraines have also been interestingly connected with increased uh, PFOs, um, but that's the kind of thing where we really don't treat these. They can be surgically treated uh, unless they're uh, symptomatic. The second shunt, fetal shunt, is the ductus arteriosus, and uh, that's a vessel connecting the pulmonary artery with the aortic arch. So here is um, the right atrium, uh, the right ventricle, pulmonary uh, vein uh, valve right here. Here is the pulmonary artery carrying the deoxygenated blood to the lungs. Again, we the lungs really are not, uh, no air is flowing into them in the fetus. The fetus is essentially just drinking amniotic fluid. And so all the oxygen is coming from the maternal circulation. Uh, so there's no need for blood to go to the lungs. So I, remember I mentioned that two thirds of the blood passes through the atrial um, you know, septum here, but the other third that ends up going into the right uh, ventricle that's gonna go through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary artery, uh, there's a little shunt here that'll connect it right to the aorta directly. And that is called the ductus arteriosus. Um, at birth, again, this should close. And the reason that happens is that when the baby takes the first breath, that actually increases the um, uh, pressure in the lungs, and that'll increase the pressure in the uh, pulmonary tree here, and that is going to um, uh, cause it to close. So that is um, um, a normal fetal shunt. Uh, when it closes, it actually becomes a ligament, a false, what we call a false ligament. It looks like a ligament, but it's actually just the remaining fibrous tissue from where that structure used to be. And that's called the ligamentum arteriosum. Um, normally in the fetus, prostaglandins, those inflammatory mediators, PGE2 and BGE1, keep the duct open. A, uh, the duct, however, can remain open after birth, and that would be called a patent ductus arteriosus, or PDA and that's where the duct fails to close. It leads to essentially what we call a left to right shunt. Um, and uh, what happens there is that the blood going out the aorta is gonna pump right back in to the right side of the heart. That's gonna put more pressure on the right ventricle and that can lead over time to enlargement of the right ventricle uh, and so forth. Um, the One of the treatments that can actually help to close the duct since the prostaglandins keep it open we can give medications that block prostaglandins, and that essentially would be NSAIDs, like indomethacin. Um, and so that inhibits PGE one and two, and that'll close the duct. Uh, there can be surgical corrections also if the uh, NSAIDs fail to work. If uncorrected, this would increase pulmonary blood pressure, leading to pulmonary hypertension, uh, right heart failure, so the right side of the heart could fail over time, and then arrhythmias uh, would be more common and uh, we'll talk about those, but that's gonna be an abnormal electrical activity in the heart. Uh, these are fairly common in Down syndrome, up to 4% of Down patients uh, have uh, patent ductus arteriosus. So a patent foramen ovale, uh, patent ductus arteriosus are two 
possible congenital malformations that can impact the heart. There's one final shunt, and that's called the ductus venosus, I'll just mention here. And that is as the mother's arterial blood comes in, it actually joins up with the inferior vena cava. Um, it's going to bypass the, in, in the liver here, it's going to actually join up with the inferior vena cava, and that will go bring the oxygenated blood to the right side of the heart. So that's how um, the uh, maternal blood flow can actually get in. Um, at birth, this duct also closes and becomes a false ligament, um, the ligament venosus. And okay, so that summarizes the fetal shunts that essentially keep the blood uh, going through the heart, but bypassing the lungs. So next we'll look at the actual structure of the heart muscle. Um, so first of all, the heart is surrounded by a membrane called the pericardium, and that's really the outer covering over the heart. And it's a double uh, walled sac of connective tissue. So there is what is called the fibrous pericardium, which is the very outside of this covering. It really anchors the heart to the surrounding walls of the chest and the lungs. And it, it's actually going to have, uh, it's not very stretchable, so it's going to prevent the uh, heart from actually overfilling with blood. So it has sort of a uh, containing aspect to it. Um, the serous pericardium is a double layered uh, layer of connective tissue. It consists of a parietal pericardium, which is fused really, and it's inseparable to the fibrous pericardium. So we can think of fibrous and parietal pericardium as one layer. And then the visceral pericardium, which is also known as the epicardium, uh, that's gonna form the outer surface of the heart muscle itself. Um, and it's composed of mesothelial cells. They secrete fluid. That fluid's gonna fill a space between essentially the parietal and the visceral pericardium known as the pericardial uh, cavity. So in this picture over here to the right, we see the parietal pericardium. Um, and that's going to be fused to the fibrous pericardium on the very outside. Then the visceral cardium forming the epicardium on the heart muscle itself. That's called the myocardium, the actual heart muscle. And then the space between them, the pericardial cavity, which because of the visceral pericardium is going to have a fluid secreted into it. And that's going to give lubrication. So think of this heart muscle as beating inside this fibrous sac. And uh, there's a layer of fluid between those two layers, and that gives lubrication and so forth. So that's the normal covering there. Now, you can have, unfortunately, some problems here where, one, you can get fluid that builds up for a variety of reasons, edema, essentially, in the uh, pericardial sac. And uh, this is called pericardial fluid. Unfortunately, what can happen there is it can actually compress the heart muscle itself. So this can cause a condition called pericardial tamponade. Um, and so that fluid can compress on the heart. It's going to make it more difficult for the heart to actually beat. Now the fluid can be just serous fluid. Most typically with pericardial tamponade, it's going to be blood. Um, and so blood's going to fuse out into that space. And that's going to severely impact the amount of blood that can be ejected from the heart, decreasing cardiac output. Um, so we'd see a, a drop in mean arterial pressure. Uh, we'd see a backup of blood in the right side of the heart and in the venous system that might cause descended uh, jugular veins in the neck. And then um, different things like different changes on EKG and something called pulses paradoxus. Pulses paradoxus is a drop in systolic pressure of more than 10 millimeters of mercury uh, with inspiration. So you could be feeling someone's pulse, and every time they breathe in, you'd feel the pulse kind of drop. It'd be, uh, you wouldn't feel the pressure there as much. Um, so that's going to be uh, one of the early warning signs of actually pericardial tamponade. could mean a lot of other things like sleep apnea or uh, asthma. It occurs in uh, a more advanced asthma as well, but that's one sign here of a pericardial tamponade. Uh, the treatment would be what's called peri uh, pericardiocentesis, where they actually place a, a needle in the chest cavity, and uh, they'll drain out, usually a very large gauge needle, like 16 to 18 gauge, uh, into the pericardial sac, and then draw out the fluid. Uh, but the you know underlying treatment would be to look at what's causing it, and we'll look later at what some of the pathophysiology behind this, what can actually lead to pericardial tamponade. Um, another condition that can affect the pericardium is per pericarditis, and that would be an inflammation of the pericardium, either acutely, can also be chronic. Um, there's a lot of different causes. Uh, autoimmune disease is one, so lupus, 
um, is uh, there is uh, lupus can affect the heart, and one thing that it can do is cause cause pericarditis. Uh, problem with the acute pericarditis, it can, that can lead to acute chest pain. Um, that could actually lead to pericardial fusion, fluid building up in the pericardial sac. Um, the chronic pericarditis is usually less um, severe in terms of symptoms, but over time can lead to scarring of the pericardial sac, and that makes it more constrictive. And so that'll make it much more difficult for the heart to beat within that sac. Um, this can happen actually after myocardial infarction. Uh, we'll talk about that a couple weeks after. You can have a phenomenon where basically the immune response can create a pericarditis. Uh, happens in more advanced TB and cancers and so forth. Uh, the findings here would be chest pain and what we call a friction rub on auscultation. So you're listening to the heartbeat and it sounds like it's beating against sandpaper. So there's a rubbing, scratchy sound. Um, on the EKG, uh, electrocardiogram, there are very distinct uh, changes that I'll talk about maybe later. So those are uh, pericardial disorders well, we should know about, pericardial tamponade and pericarditis. Okay, so the very outer layer of the heart is the epicardium that's made up of the visceral pericardium. The next major layer, and by far the majority of the heart muscle, is the myocardium. And um, this is where the cardiac myocytes or heart muscle cells are located. Um, the myocytes are arranged around a collagen framework. Um, so they have an inner structure. And it's very interesting that the uh, muscle cells are arranged in this framework in two spiral arrangements. So we can think of the heart as really two spirals sort of put together. Um, there's actually seven layers of these spiraling muscles. And there was an anatomist in the 19th century, um, Pettigrew that actually in cow's hearts made molds of these different fibers. And uh, the significance of this is that the heart contracts, not just in a simple contraction relaxation, but every time it contracts, it twists. So there's a twisting motion uh, in the ventricles. And so the blood is ejected, for example, from the left ventricle into the aorta with a twisting motion. And we think that spiral formation is very important for creating a smooth flow of blood through the aorta. Um, it also has a way of propelling all the red cells in there. And interestingly, as the red cells are propelled in the right way, they're given an electrical charge. So all your red cells actually have a negative charge on the outside. Interestingly, the endothelium in your capillaries also has a negative charge. And these two charges repel each other, and that keeps the red cells from getting too close or sticking to the walls in the endothelium. And partly this spiraling motion of how the heart is eject, how the blood is ejected from the heart helps to uh, restore that charge. Um, the uh, cardiac myocytes are embedded amongst them. There are also nerve fibers. So I mentioned that the main conducting system, how the electrical conduction uh, occurs in the heart, uh, occurs through specialized myocytes. But there are also sensory nerves and whatnot embedded in the heart muscle wall, and they're sort of found uh, arranged around those myocytes. Um, the, uh, I mentioned that in embryology, the way that the heart develops, there's sort of a precursor cell that gives rise to both the blood vessels and the blood cells. And some of those cells will settle out from the fluid stream forming the blood vessels, or in this case, the walls of the heart. Others will go on to become blood cells and will stay mobile in the fluid portion of the blood. Um, and so we think that the reason the heart has the spiral in it is that it's just mimicking what was initially a vortex blood flow. I mentioned that the blood flow was already occurring a day before the heart actually begins to beat. Um, but this fluid flow that was already there. Uh, the cells sort of coagulate out around those lines of streaming and they form the walls of the heart. And if you want to read more about that, there's a, I put up a website here uh, that you might want to explore and there's a couple of books connected with this as well. Um, so that's uh, the structure of the myocardium. Notice that the left ventricle is uh, significantly larger than um, the right ventricle. So in this case here in systole, here's the right ventricle, do it in blue here, here's the right ventricle, here is a cross section of the left ventricle, much more thick walled. Um, in that's in diastole actually, in systole with contraction, it's even smaller. So um, that's between diastole and systole. Okay, so that's the myocardium, the actual muscle layer of the heart. Then the most, the innermost chamber would be the endocardium, 
And that really com is composed of those endothelial cells that we looked at in the last video. Uh, this is simple squamous epithelium. Um, this is the lining of the heart chambers as well as the valves of the heart. Now the valves are made, the actual core of the valve is more of a fibrous connective tissue, but they're lined in endothelium. The layer just below the endothelium between the myocardium and the endothelium is called this subendothelium. And that's what's in direct contact with the um, uh, myocardium. And this, this area contains small blood vessels, nerves, and what are called Purkinje fibers. Again, these are gonna help spread the electrical signal through the heart muscle. Um, this area receives the least oxygenation from the coronary arteries. Now, I'll come back to that here in just a minute. We'll look at this in the next slide, I think. But the coronary arteries, so the heart is interesting in that although it passes all this blood, it needs its own circulatory system to feed itself. So basically what happens is if we look at the enlargement of the heart, I'll just start with this picture up here. As the blood leaves the aorta here, so it goes from the left ventricle through the aorta, there's a little um, outflow, little circulatory system of blood vessels that actually come down and are gonna feed the heart muscle itself. And that's those are called the coronary arteries. And they're gonna actually enter the heart from the outside through the, uh, they're underneath the pericardium and uh, they're actually up against the epicardium and they're gonna send vessels down into the myocardium and that's gonna feed it. Um, a little bit of oxygenation happens in nutrition of the endocardium directly from the blood, but the subendocardium is very susceptible to any change in blood flow from those coronary arteries. So if you look at the picture here, <clears throat> here is the uh, pericardium on the outside, the fibrous, the parietal, and the visceral. Here we have a coronary artery kind of passing right into that pericardial space. Um, and it's sending a little projection down through the myocardium and down to the endocardium. So this would be the uh, endocardium here. And this region is the subendocardium right in here. Um, and so the subendocardium is gonna be the area that's gonna be potentially most susceptible to uh, not getting enough oxygen from the coronary arteries or from the blood directly this way. <clears throat> so if we have a blockage, for example, of a coronary artery, which can happen with the atherosclerosis, and we'll talk about that in the pathology section, it can block blood flow. The outer layers could still get adequate flow from surrounding coronary arteries and so forth, but this layer is gonna be the most susceptible and that tissue can undergo a process called ischemia. Ischemia is basically where we get decreased oxygen from decreased blood flow, and that's going to cause the cells to stop functioning uh, normally. So normally we need lots of oxygen to, main ATP, to maintain ATP. So we get a decrease of ATP and that's going to actually impact the so-called sodium potassium ATPase pump. And that's going to change the electrical gradients on either side of the, um, of the cell. And that's going and now the cell will stop functioning normally. Um, why this area is so significant is that the Purkinje fibers are the main conducting system in the ventricles to carry the electrical signal through the ventricles. So as we'll see, the electrical signal will come down this part, the septum, there's actually two little branches that carry it down. It's gonna diffuse back up, then it kind of travel up the inside in the subendocardium this way. And as that electrical signal goes down, all the surrounding muscle will start contracting. Uh, so we'll look at how that spreads here in just a moment, but the subendocardium is going to be most susceptible to ischemia. If the ischemia gets so bad that the cells begin to die, then we call that infarction. And uh, so if you have a myocardial infarction, an MI, uh, this would be an example of that. Now we'll find there's two different types of MIs. Um, one essentially occurs in the uh, subendocardium and that is called a subendocardial infarct or a non-STEMI. Uh, what that means is um, on the EKG, there's a very specific sign we look for. It's called an ST segment elevation, and I'll talk about that later. Um, and that's gonna happen more typically with your larger heart attacks. Those are called transmural. They're gonna affect the myocardium primarily, and they're gonna be much more serious as you can imagine. Some endocardial infarcts are not as severe uh, but they can give rise to all sorts of arrhythmias and other things. Um, and so they're called a STEMI 
non-STEMI MI versus the transmural are called STEMI uh, or ST segment elevation MIs. So a little bit uh, jumping ahead there to pathology, but that's where that's going to be significant. So that's the three layers of the heart, the epicardium, the myocardium, and the endocardium. Next, we have the heart valves. Um, there are four valves, as mentioned before. Uh, they're mostly collagen uh, with some elastin, and they're lined in endothelium. Um, now, the opening uh, and closing of the heart valves is a passive process, so there's no active muscle contraction or anything that is driving them. And that's purely driven by pressure differences on either side of the valve. So increased pressure on one side will cause it to close, and uh, it's the closing of the valves that actually makes the heart sounds. So when you listen to the heart with a stethoscope and you hear the characteristic lub dub, uh, we call lub S1 the first heart sound and dub S2. The first heart sound is the closing of the atrial ventricular valves, the uh, tricuspid valve and the uh, bicuspid or mitral valve. So remember this is the tricuspid valve is what separates the right atrium from the right ventricle and the bicuspid or mitral valve separates the left atrium from the left uh, ventricle. Um, so S1 is from closure of those two valves, and then S2, the second heart sound, the dub, is from the closure of the pulmonary and the aortic valves. Um, these are also known as the semi-lunar valves. They look like little half moons in shape. Um, so that's going to be marking the two most important cardiac events, which is in the case of the first heart sound and the closure of the AV valves, that's the beginning of the contraction phase of the heart called systole, and then the closing of the um, semilunar or SL valves uh, will be the beginning of diastole. So we'll look at how to put all this together in the cardiac physiology section, um, but the, just know that the heart sounds actually come from the closing of the valves, not the opening of the valves. Um, now I will mention a couple of things in the future. We'll talk about what are called cardiac murmurs, um, and that would be abnormal heart sounds, and that can come from uh, the valve not properly opening or closing uh, or being too lax where blood is backflowing now from one chamber to another, so we'll look at all those possibilities as we go. So the major valves are the atrial ventricular valves or AV valves, um, and that would include, again, the tricuspid between the right atrium and right ventricle. It contributes to the uh, S1 heart sound, and we actually divide the first heart sound into uh, a T1 sound and a M1 sound. So the T1 would be from the tricuspid valve, and the M1 would be from the mitral. So what you're hearing in LUB is the combination of those two. Now, where this is important is that sometimes you can hear these two sounds don't align, and that's called splitting, where we hear one sound before the other. And we'll talk about what can cause splitting. You hear that most commonly with the S2 sound, um, but um, this could indicate different pathologies. Um, the tricuspid valve has three fibrous flaps, which is why we call it tricuspid. And the flaps are all anchored uh, by little cords, and these are connective tissue cords called the cordy tendony, and the cords themselves are attached to muscle. So if you look at this picture, you can see the cordy tendony here. Um, so they're connecting, this is the valve up here, and so they're connecting it, almost like uh, little strings on a balloon, and they're connected down to the papillary muscle here, which is anchored to the the myocardium in the heart wall. So why this is important is that when the valve closes and the ventricles contract, let's look at this picture down here to the right to show that. So here's the, this is looking at the left side of the heart with the mitral valves. It's going to be the same on this side where we have cordy tendony and then the papillary muscle. So when the uh, left ventricle contracts, we're going to want all the blood that's come in from the left atrium. So here is the mitral valve right here. Um, when the heart contracts, this valve is going to have to close, and the closing of that sound will be the M1 sound, in this case, on the S1 heart sound. Um, it's going to close, and then all the blood's going to go out through the aortic valve, which we don't hear open normally unless there is calcification or a narrowing or scarring, and that's called stenosis. We'll talk about that later. But under normal circumstances, we don't hear the aortic valve open. Uh, but the uh, mitral valve closes as the left ventricle contracts and the blood gets a lot of pressure uh, 
um, we don't want it back flowing into the left atrium. And so these strings, the chordae tendineae, will actually prevent blood from flowing back uh, into the left atrium. Uh, any damage to the uh, chordae tendineae or the papillary muscle will often result in back flow. In fact, they can be a little overstretched or loose in what's called mitral regurgitation, where we get regurged during systole, during the contraction of the heart, back into the left atrium. Um, it also can happen that a major heart attack, if you live through it, <clears throat> and a lot of people do actually live through heart attacks, myocardial infarctions, but what happens in a myocardial infarction is the cardiac myocytes are actually dying in an MI, and myocytes are permanent cells, meaning they cannot regenerate. There's no stem cells that give rise to them, and so that area is going to die, basically. It's under, you're going to undergo necrosis, so if you had a major part of the myocardium undergo infarction, uh, it might die. And then in the days to weeks following, the immune system goes in to clean it up, becomes very weak. And if that's by the papillary muscle, that can become weak. These cords now become detached or they're not anchored properly. And now we get mitral regurge as a result of that. So we'll look at all the complications of a myocardial infarction, but mitral regurgitation can be one of them. Um, so that's the tricuspid and the, and the mitral valve. Now the mitral valve only has two fibrous flaps and so it's uh, also known as the bicuspid valve and it's going to contribute to the M1 again sound and the first heart sound. So that's the AV or atrial ventricular valves. The semilunar or SL valves would be the pulmonic valve and that's going to be between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. Uh, it normally has three cusps and uh, it contributes on the S2 heart sound so the second heart sound, dub, uh, equals P2 plus A2. And that's going to be the pulmonic valve and the aortic valve. And again, normally we hear them usually together. So we just hear one uh, dub in this case. So lub dub, you hear one sound. Uh, but they can be split. So I'll talk about that here in just a moment. Um, so that's the P2. And then we have aortic valve between the left ventricle and aorta. This one normally has three cusps as well, and it contributes to the A2 component of the uh, uh, S2 heart sound. Usually A2 is louder than P2, but again, if they come at the same time, you can't distinguish them. Um, now, there is a situation where you can, can generally only have two cusps on the aortic valve, um, and uh, this is called a, um, so you get a bicuspid valve there instead of a tricuspid valve. And this actually increases the risk of valve disease later in life. So people with that congenital abnormality are much higher, uh, at higher risk for what's called aortic stenosis, where the uh, flap of the valve becomes very stiff, it becomes narrowed, and it's very difficult for the left ventricle to push blood out into the aorta. And so as a result, pressure builds up in the left ventricle, and over time, the muscle wall begins to thicken. It undergoes a process of hypertrophy, and that over time can lead to heart failure. And so we'll see that aortic stenosis, if it gets bad enough, is one of those situations where they actually need to go in and replace the aortic valve uh, with either an artificial valve, uh, a porcine valve, or uh, a valve from a human host. Um, Okay, so that's uh, aortic stenosis. Um, again, S2 can be split, and that means you're going to hear a difference between P2 and A2. So instead of hearing lub dub, you're going to hear lub dub dub, lub dub dub, lub dub dub. And that splitting sound indicates that the valves are not closing at the same time. Um, typically, if this happens with inspiration, that's normally normal. So if you hear that splitting with inspiration, that's because the pressures against either valve are a little bit different based on the when the lungs become inflated with air. Um, but it's pathological if it happens with both inspiration and expiration, that could be a sign of valve disease. And we'll talk about that in the valve disease section. So that's the uh, AV, atrial ventricular, and semilunar SL valves. Now I mentioned that the heart muscle, although all this blood is passing through the heart, the heart muscle itself needs its own circulatory system. Um, so although this five liters of blood passes through the heart every minute, um, the myocardium directly can't receive nourishment from it. The endocardium can get some nourishment from the heart, but really the myocardium and the subendocardium need their own circulatory system. And that's provided by the coronary arteries. 
So these come off the proximal aorta. So just where the aorta leaves the left ventricle. Um, so if you look at this picture here, here is the, uh, remember left ventricle uh, would be here in this region. And here is the aorta coming off. Um, so the aortic valve would be right in here. Um, right after the valve, we have a little circulatory system that comes out and that's going to give rise to the coronary arteries. Um, and the vessels lie just deep to the epicardium. They're on the surface of the heart and they flow. Uh, and the flow is actually through the arteries only at diastole. So when the heart is contracting and blood is ejected through the aorta, it doesn't go into the coronary system. But during the relaxation phase of the heart, that's when the coronary system gets its circulation. Um, so it's really a dual blood supply to the heart. So the epicardium and the myocardium are supplied by the coronary arteries and their branches. And the endocardium uh, is going to get a direct uh, supply from direct contact with the blood. Um, now, unfortunately, when uh, that coronary artery flow is compromised, it's going to be, remember, the subendocardial tissue that's most vulnerable to any sort of ischemic injury. So that'll be important when we look at MIs. Um, the right coronary artery supplies the lateral wall of the right ventricle, posterior wall of the left ventricle, the posterior one-third of the intraventricular septum, and then the pacemakers, the SA node and the AV node. Now, I didn't mention where those are located. We'll look at that here in the last slide on this package, um, but those are up there in the right ventricle. Um, the principal branches off of the RCA, the right coronary artery, are the marginal artery and the posterior descending artery. So that's all depicted here uh, on this side of this picture here. Now, there's some anatomical differences. In about 85% of people, they have what's called a right dominant circulation, and the posterior descending artery comes off the right coronary artery, versus in about 8% of people, <clears throat> the uh, uh, they're what we call left dominant circulation, and the PDA arises from the left coronary, and we'll look at that here, or what's called the left circumflex artery. And then in 7% of people, it's a mix. Why this is important is when cardiologists go in to do imaging of these vessels, it's important that they know the different anatomical uh, differences there. Now, the left uh, coronary artery, LCA, has an anterior descending artery, um, and this is important because this is probably the most common site of occlusion. So the thinking right now, and I'll talk about some challenges to this theory, but the thinking right now behind uh, myocardial infarction, MI, um, is basically people have an underlying risk of what's called atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, they form plaques, these atheromas in the coronary arteries, and that's depicted in this picture down here. And these plaques essentially block the artery, and they're going to prevent circulation downstream. And then uh, they can also form blood clots on top of them, and the blood clots can actually uh, quickly form, and they can block completely the blood flow through that vessel. Well, if that vessel is, for example, feeding you know, a portion of the right ventricle or the left ventricle or something like that, that area of myocardium is now susceptible to ischemia and potential infarction. Um, so one of the most common sites where this happens is in the left, uh, uh, the anterior descending uh, artery. It branches off the left coronary artery. So here's the left coronary up here in this diagram. And, uh, and then we see the difference. We see the left anterior descending artery coming down. This is the main artery that feeds the anterior surface of the left ventricle. So again, left ventricle is our most significant portion of the heart muscle really pushing the blood into the aorta. So this is going to result in the most kind of uh, uh, potentially dangerous MIs uh, of all of them. Um, and that's going to supply, you know, again, the left ventricle, including the apex of the heart and the anterior two thirds of the interventricular septum. That's the tissue that separates the right and the left atrium, uh, ventricles. And then the left circumflex artery supplies the posterior wall of the left ventricle and the posterior one third of the interventricular septum. So you don't need to memorize all of those. Know that there is a left and the right coronary artery and they have several branches and know that the uh, anterior descending artery uh, coming off of the uh, left coronary artery is um, uh, the most common site of coronary artery occlusion. Okay, and then um, 
occlusion itself again, left anterior descending artery, 40 to 50% of occlusions, right coronary artery would be next in line, and then left circumflex artery. Now the venous system is simpler. The blood flows from the myocardium into cardiac veins, which are found on the outer surface of the heart. And then it drains in what's called the coronary sinus, which then directly drains into, that's shown here, directly drains into the um, right atrium. And uh, so it's going to collect with all the other venous blood there. So that's the coronary artery circulation and uh, blood supply to the myocardium of the heart. Now, one way physicians can visualize the coronary arteries to see if there is any obstruction in those arteries is using coronary angiography. Um, and so this can be done either for purposes of diagnosis or treatment. And so we, this is part of what's called interventional cardiology, where they can go in and uh, you know, do procedures to, for example, widen or open up that coronary artery to increase circulation into that, that region. Um, in the coronary arteries, we need to perform, we can perform this test to uh, diagnose any sort of occlusion or blockage. If there is a narrowing or stenosis, if there are any blood clots that have formed inside those coronary arteries, or if there's any enlargement from an aneurysm. What an aneurysm is, is a weakening in the muscle layer or the elastin on that artery. And so it bulges and a bulging artery is susceptible to rupture. Um, so angiography can also visualize those. Um, we can see any uh, advanced remodeling going on inside the coronary artery walls and any formation of those plaques or uh, atheromas that we see in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, can also use angiography to visualize the size of the heart chambers, um, the heart muscle contraction performance, some aspects of the valve function. Although typically now we use ultrasound, the special types of ultrasound that uh, give us better images for that. So we kind of reserve angiography in most cases to visualizing the coronary arteries. Now, in terms of the diagnostic procedure, uh, this is performed um, using what's called a catheterization lab or cath lab, um, you know, usually in a hospital. The uh, physician will guide the small catheter, usually it's about two millimeters in diameter, through uh, the large arteries in the body, often entering down in the uh, leg. Uh, so we do incision down here into the femoral artery, and then we the catheter is fed up, actually, the iliac arteries up the aorta all the way to the heart. Um, and they can actually go in, uh, loop around the aorta, go in actually into the coronary artery opening. And what they can do is they can inject a radio uh, x-ray radio contrast dye uh, into the artery. And that makes the blood flow visible for about three to five seconds. And there's a little x-ray machine that immediately takes a picture. So if you look at this picture over here, you can see the contrast agent has been injected into the opening of the coronary artery system. And the picture was taken and notice there are a couple of narrowing uh, areas of narrowing. So here's one, oh, pen's not working. Uh, here's one right here and here's another. And so this indicates potential blockage in those arteries. Again, this is from an most likely an atherosclerotic plaque. Um, so this is a conventional theory. So that's, um, you know, we can get an image of that and um, we can see if there's any blockages that might be contributing to a heart attack or if a person just having chest pain, that sort of thing. And then the angiography can be done as a procedure and that would be a percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI. A PCI is basically where uh, the catheter is fed in, uh, but this time it actually on the end of it has a little stent. Uh, so typically it has a balloon that can be inflated and the balloon will then widen that area of blockage. And then the stent is like a little chicken wire mesh that goes in there to keep it open. Uh, and then uh, some of these stents actually have medication in there uh, that over time will be diffused that will prevent any scarring or fibrosis from building up around that stent. One of the big problems I mentioned, again, one of the factors that can make blood more likely to clot is increased turbulence in the bloodstream. So sticking a stent in there would definitely increase turbulence. But also whenever there's a foreign body, foreign matter contacting the blood, that will also make it more likely to clot. So a big problem of these stents is that people are more likely to clot now and form 
clots inside the stent, which can further block the circulation. So the majority of these patients that get the PCI will need to be on antiplatelet medication to prevent platelets from sticking together. And a very common one is something called clopidogrel or Plavix. And usually patients have to take that, if not for months or years, for life after uh, having that procedure to prevent that from happening. The um, stents that have the medications to prevent the inflammation fibrosis are known as drug eluding stents. So that's going to be usually a chemotherapy drug that's put in there to prevent that from happening. So this is basically the kind of, I'll call this the plumbing theory of uh, why we get myocardial infarctions and so forth is that you get a blockage usually from atherosclerosis of a coronary artery. You can go in with a stent and you can open that back up again. There's a lot of challenges to this theory now, uh, even though this is the major approach in cardiology, there's data emerging that uh, it might not be as simple as this. In fact, most of these areas of, areas of blockage um, develop what are called collateral circulation. So they form slowly and you get little blood vessels that kind of form around them, not shown here on this particular image, uh, but that's feeding the uh, underlying myocardium. So um, the kind of theory behind this has some holes in it. Uh, we'll look at that in more detail in the cardiac pathology section, but this is a little bit you should know about what an angiogram is and how you can use it both diagnostically and therapeutically. Finally, let's look at the innervation of the heart. Um, now the heart basically has two levels of nerve innervation. So uh, we can have what are called intrinsic cardiac neurons, and these are neurons inside the heart muscle wall. And then there are extrinsic cardiac neurons, and that's uh, nerves coming from outside. And these are usually part of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. Um, now, again, this is different from what's called the cardiac conducting system, and that's gonna be specialized myocytes, muscle cells, that are going to convey the electrical signal through the heart with each heartbeat that's going to cause the muscle contraction. And I'll look at that here next. Um, so that's, that's not made of neurons, that's made of muscle cells. The intrinsic cardiac neurons are embedded in the myocardium. Um, and uh, basically these uh, have both sympathetic and parasympathetic branches, but uh, they're largely connected to, they have, it's like a part of a sensory system. So, so I mentioned earlier, we can think of the heart as a giant sensory organ, and it's really sensing through the endocardium, um, through the pressure of the blood coming back into the different chambers of the heart and so forth. It's sensing the blood, and um, it's looking at alterations in both the mechanical and the chemical milieu of the various regions of the heart. Um, and it's bringing all that information back, much of it through the vagus nerve, to the brain, and so the brain is able to respond to that. There is actually a field of study known as neurocardiology, which studies the relationship between the heart and the brain. Um, so you might have heard this notion of the heart brain, how we can really perceive and even potentially think through our heart. Well, that would be utilizing these intrinsic cardiac neurons. Um, there is uh, something I'll talk about a little later called the Heart Math Institute. And the Heart Math Institute actually has a lot of literature on neurocardiology. In fact, they have a whole textbook uh, a medical doctor put together uh, that you could download from there on the subject of neurocardiology. Um, then we have the extrinsic cardiac neurons, which from the purposes of physiology, we're more interested in. Um, and that's neurons that arise from, again, the sympathetics and the parasympathetics. So the fibers have both a motor aspect and then sensory, that would be the afferent, and that's going to be connected to the, ne the uh, neurons I just talked about. Um, the sympathetic nerves arise from the thoracic spine. And uh, like we saw uh, earlier in the neurology block, the uh, thoracic spine sends out neurons um, through the uh, dorsal roots, I'm sorry, through the ventral roots, and they're going to actually go into the thoracic uh, chain, the sympathetic chain on either side of the spine, and then neurons will be sent out to the heart. So the, the uh, sympathetic nervous system sends neurons to what's called the cardiac plexus. They all converge around the heart, and then fibers enter the heart muscle itself. And these neurons secrete norepinephrine is their primary neurotransmitter, and the primary receptor on myocytes is a beta-1 receptor. And what uh, stimulation of beta-1 receptors does is it will increase your heart rate and increase the force of heart contractions. 
So we call that contractility. So it increases the uh, heart rate and contractility of the heart. Um, a change in heart rate is called the chronotrophic effect. So an increase of heart rate is called a positive chronotrophic. And the change of the force of contractions depends on the ion flow in the heart muscle cells. And we call that an inotropic effect. So sympathetic stimulation has a positive chronotropic and a positive inotropic effect. Parasympathetic nerves, um, I should say sympathetic nerves innervate your pacemakers, so the so-called AB node and SA node, uh, as well as most of the heart muscles. So sympathetics really wrap your entire heart. Parasympathetics, we think, have a more limited innervation. They definitely innervate your SA node, your primary pacemaker, um, and their main neurotransmitter is, in, uh, is acetylcholine. And remember that for the heart, the primary uh, parasympathetic supply is coming from the vagus nerve. Uh, so the vagus innervates the heart. And uh, the receptors are muscarinic receptors on myocytes. And the, um, they're also found on the SAAB nodes, the pacemakers. Um, so its main effect, parasympathetic stimulation, the main effect is to decrease heart rate. There's some question about how much effect it has on heart contractility because it doesn't seem like the parasympathetic fibers innervate as much as the heart as the sympathetics. That uh, changes, that information changes with more research. Um, and we will see that a leading theory as to what really causes heart attacks and even heart failure is this idea that there is too much sympathetic stimulation uh, and not enough parasympathetic stimulation uh, on the heart muscle. And as a result of that, that leads to a condition that changes the metabolism of the heart muscle cells, leading to heart attacks and heart failure and so forth. I'll explore that theory in the pathology section. But that's the importance of the sympathetics and parasympathetics. So sympathetics, positive chronotropic, inotropic effects. Uh, parasympathetics, more of a negative chronotropic effect, uh, potentially little uh, to moderate inotropic effects. Okay, so those are the extrinsic cardiac neurons. Finally, I'll end this video on the cardiac conduction system. <clears throat> this is a specialized um, sort of conduction system that consists of uh, specialized cardiac myocytes. And this is what's gonna allow for the atrial and ventricular contraction. Uh, so just very quickly, and we'll see this again in more depth in, in the physiology videos, but basically up here in the right ventricle where the superior vena cava meets, so right up here, we have what's called the SA or sinoatrial node. And um, this is it's right beneath the pericardium. Um, the blood uh, supply is actually from the right coronary artery. So any blockage to the right coronary artery could result in ischemia in the uh, SA node, and that could uh, affect its activity. This is a pacemaker. So there are cells inside of here, the specialized myocytes, that left to their own start to undergo spontaneous electrical depolarization. So if you just took an SA node out and put it in a Petri dish in a nutrient bath, it would actually just beat on its own. Um, and uh, we'll look at the uh, reason for why that happens. That, ha that occurs because the cells there actually have very special ion channels uh, that are gonna allow that to occur at rest. Um, so these uh, channels allow it to spontaneously depolarize at a regular rate. And that's why this area, this collection of cells right here is actually gonna be the primary pacemaker. It's gonna set the uh, rhythm of the entire heart itself. Uh, generally at rest, it's gonna be uh, with no, if you have no autonomic regulation, it uh, has a spontaneous depolarization rate of around 100 beats per minute. Uh, but because of parasympathetic input, that slows down to about 80 impulses. So typically, there's going to be a range of between 60 and 100 beats per minute on the SA node. That's going to vary with both your sympathetic and parasympathetic input. Uh, I'll just say here, we can have what's called tachycardia. Uh, tachycardia is having a rapid heart rate, and that's anything over 100 beats per minute. Or bradycardia would be anything under... Uh, 60 beats per minute. So those are the definitions of tachy and bradycardia. And we'll look at that. Uh, many of those cases are totally benign, why we get tachy or bradycardia, but others could indicate a problem in the SA node or anywhere along the conduction system. And so we'll look at that when we explore cardiac uh, arrhythmias in more depth. Um, 
So this has the highest rate of depolarization. Now, what's interesting, and this is jumping to the physiology section a little bit, uh, heart muscles are interesting because they can be entrained by other cells. In other words, they, uh, if you have a pacemaker and that signal is going out from that pacemaker, it's being conducted along different myocytes, it's going to entrain all the cells downstream to its rhythm. And the fastest pacemaker will overwhelm and take over as the primary pacemaker. So in this case, the SA node has the highest firing rate. It's going to be the master pacemaker. It's going to, the signal from the SA node will trickle down through very specialized conduction pathways. And that's shown here in green. Uh, I'm tracing it in blue. So it's going to uh, pass down these conduction pathways through the right and the left atrium. And uh, there's several, there's what's called the uh, anterior internodal tract, middle internodal, posterior internodal, and Bachmann's bundle. Sometimes we get an accessory tract, I'll talk about that, called the bundle of Kent, which can create uh, different types of arrhythmias. We'll look at that later. Um, but as the electrical signal spreads down, and again, these are made up of specialized myocytes that, are, uh, that have intercalated discs between them. So as the electrical signal is going to spread, it actually spreads over the surface of these cells. Uh, it's going to cause surrounding cardiac muscle cells, which again are all adjoined via intercalated discs, to contract. So as the electrical signal spreads down, it's going to cause this cell to contract, then this cell, and so forth. So as the electrical signal goes down, the heart muscle contracts in unison. And um, all of that, all that electrical activity will actually end up uh, in one specific place, and that's depicted here. This is called the AV node. So it's going to spread through the atria, and it's going to go all to the AV node. Now, not shown in this picture, there's actually a pretty thick fibrous uh, layer between the atria and the ventricles. So because of the valves, remember they're here, and everything else, the only way the electrical signal can get from the atria to the ventricles is through the AV node. So it's going to collect at the AV node, and by this time, the atria have already contracted. From the AV node, it's going to go down this little area here called the bundle of His, um, H-I-S, bundle of His. And then from the bundle of His, it's going to go down through the interventricular septum, um, and it's going to divide into what's called the left bundle and the right bundle. And again, these are all specialized uh, cardiac myocytes. Then the electrical signal will go down to the end of the, uh, to the apex of the heart, this region here, and it will then spread up through what are called Purkinje fibers on either side of the ventricles. So what's gonna happen is the atria are gonna contract, electrical signal will go down this septum here to the apex of the heart, and then it'll spread up to the ventricles, and as it goes up to the ventricles, it causes them to contract. So what that's gonna do is actually start squeezing the heart from the apex upward. And that's what's gonna push the blood through the aorta or through the pulmonary artery. Um, so almost think of like squeezing a tube of toothpaste from the end upward. That's what's gonna happen as the heart muscle depolarizes and contracts. So that's the cardiac conduction system. So through the AV node. Uh, now the AV node um, depolarizes actually if the SA node goes offline, uh, in other words, if the SA node uh, was not firing up here, the AV node could take over uh, as a pacemaker to pace the ventricles. Uh, but it depolarizes at a slower rate, between 40 and 60 beats per minute. So uh, that's one of the reasons when we have bradycardia, we have to see, did the SA node go offline? And is the AV node pacing the heart on its own? Um, so it can become what's called a secondary pacemaker. Um, now... There can be damage to the AV node, and that can cause different types of heart block. That can slow the signal or actually completely block it from getting from the atria to the ventricles. Uh, so we'll look at that again in the arrhythmia section. That would be a type of heart block. Uh, I mentioned the bundle of His. That's also known as the atrioventricular bundle. Interestingly, those cells, if the AV node goes offline, they can pace on their own too, but their rate is about 30 to 40 beats per minute. And uh, so they can still pace the ventricles, but at a much slower rate. And usually at that point, people are becoming very symptomatic uh, because of decreased cardiac output. Um, 
And then we have our bundle branches right and left. They actually can pace as well. And then the Purkinje fibers, they have their own in firing rate of 15 to 20 impulses a minute. That's usually not sufficient on its own to maintain proper cardiac output. So uh, those are kind of a, the last resort backup system for the heart to use. Um, okay, so that's the pathway of conduction. Well, again, we'll look at that in detail in the physiology section and look specifically at what are the differences between what we can call the conductive myocytes, the ones that conduct the electrical signal, uh, the ones I depicted here, uh, versus the contractive myocytes, the ones that are contracting with that electrical signal. Uh, there's a difference in the types of ion channels and so forth that are found inside of them. Okay, so that wraps it up for the uh, anatomy of the whole cardiovascular system, and in this case, the heart. And the next series of videos, we'll look at the physiology of the heart in the cardiovascular system. And then finally, we'll jump into pathology and different uh, cardiovascular disorders.